But the ones that are complex allow us to put together the way marks that will exist in all um, the reform movements. And it starts at the time to end. And we purposely go over these a few times because by the time we get through these reform lines, you should understand them. I'm not, I'm not telling you should or you're going to be punished. <laughs> you will understand them from experience, even if you're head swimming right now. By the time we're done with these lines tomorrow, you'll be able to line, line them out. The time at the end, um, in each of these reform movements, is a fulfillment of a prophecy. Um, as um, Jamal was pointing out, the prophecy that was fulfilled that began the history of the three decrees was the 70 years. The 70 year prophecy began with the destruction of Jerusalem, and 70 years later, Babylon fell. And Daniel, when he was studying the prophecies of Jeremiah, he understood that that 70 year prophecy was fulfilled. And because of that, he knew that it was time for the Jews to come out of Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem. The fulfillment of this prophecy in the time of the end will shed light upon the coming history. The coming history that Jamal dealt with was the building of Jerusalem, the streets and the wall. Um, there comes a point at, at the time of the end, there is an increase of knowledge that begins. And there comes a point in time where this increase of knowledge is formalized. Jamal put that over here message formalized. What that means is that this increase of knowledge has to be put into an understandable message because this increase of knowledge, according to Daniel 12, is going to test that generation. Remember, in Daniel 12, the wise understood the increase of knowledge, but the wicked did not understand the increase of knowledge. In order for us to be held accountable for a test, the Lord allows the message to be put into an understandable package. This is the message formalized here. And then there comes an empowerment. Um, and this is the first waymark. Um, sometimes we call it the first decree, sometimes the first message, but it's probably better to call it the first waymark because this is representing many timelines. I don't remember if Jamal pointed out how the message in the three decrees was empowered. I'm going to point it out now for you. He, he pointed out that when the message is empowered, there's a divine symbol that comes down. I don't remember if he spent time because he had a lot of ground to cover. He called it heavenly body. Yeah, but he, I didn't, he, didn't, he didn't tell us how it came down. That's my point. In order for, in this history here, when the message is formalized, there's usually a human being that is identified that is the one that is associated with the, the gathering together of this message. In the three decrees, who was that human being? Was it Daniel? Daniel's back here at the time of the end, representing the students of prophecy that run to and fro when the prophecy is unsealed. Cyrus is the one that recognizes from prophecy that the Jews are to come out of Babylon and rebuild Jerusalem. You remember the story of Cyrus. But Cyrus backslid on his willingness to participate in allowing the Jews to do that work. And in Daniel chapter 10, Gabriel comes to Daniel and tells him, we're not going to look there because this is just a review. Gabriel comes to Daniel and says, I struggled with Cyrus for three weeks to get him straightened out on on this work, but I, I couldn't prevail. But Michael, one of the chief priests came, and Michael is Christ. He came down, and at that point, he got Cyrus's head on straight, and that work was in power. When, when the, the increase of knowledge reaches the point where the message is formalized, and then there's a place where it's empowered, and when it's empowered, that is marked by a divine symbol coming down. We'll show you several of those. Um, all you need, as Jamal was pointing out, when you bring these lines upon lines, and we're going to put many of them up, up here, in order to identify a waymark, a characteristic in a waymark, you just need two or three. On the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. These reform movements will not possess all the characteristics, but when you bring them together, line upon line, the characteristics that we are identifying are well established. Then, in chapter 2, you have the false decree that stopped the work. Um, 
the activities of the enemies is illustrated in connection with the second way mark. And uh, Jamal pointed out how the activities of the enemies were to stop the third decree, followed by disappointment. The work was given to God's people. They backslid. And then Nehemiah's fourth decree. And the fourth decree, the point of reference for Advent is to understand why the fourth decree is the same as the second. The second angel's message is Babylon is fallen. What's the fourth angel's message? Babylon is fallen. So this is one of the arguments why we're saying the fourth is the same as the second. And therefore, it's preceded by a one and followed by a three. Um, we went over all those. Um, it was in the history of the first decree that the foundations were laid. Oh, that's an F, sorry. Um, that, you have baby right? Okay, let's move to I, I, I don't need to do that right now. The reason that we're, we're talking about the foundations being laid, so that we, you can get some of the significance of this, turn with me if you would to Isaiah 58, 12. And remember that all the prophets are speaking of the end of the world. And in Isaiah 58, 12, you have an illustration of part of the work of the 134,000. And it says, And they that shall be of thee shall build up the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And it's many generations in plural. And as we go through these reform movements, and we're, we're dealing with great controversy 343, where Sister White says the reform movements parallel one another, we find that in the first, the history of the first way mark, the foundations are identified as being established. And the 144,000 are going to teach the laddering message by bringing line upon line. And we're, what we're saying specifically here with the laddering message is taught by bringing these reform messages, these lines of history from these reform movements together, line upon line, in order to illustrate the final reform movement of the 144,000. And one of the things that we're familiar with is that the 144,000 are going to raise up the foundations of many generations. As we go through and demonstrate that in the history of the first way mark, the foundation is, is identified, then when you get down to the history of the reform movement of the Millerites, you know what you can demonstrate? You can demonstrate that it was William Miller that was used to establish the foundations of Adventism, and that those foundations are represented on that chart, which is almost totally rejected by the Adventist church today. All right? So, the work of the 144,000, one of their works, is to raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorers of paths to dwell in. And what are the paths to dwell in? Go to Jeremiah 6.16. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old path, which is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. And rest and refreshing are identifying what? The latter rain. Sabbath, latter rain. But they said, We will not walk therein. This, there's going to be an argument about returning to the old past, and the 144,000 return to the old past because they're going to raise up the foundations of many generations, and they're going to understand that the foundations of Adventism were raised up in the Millerite history by the truths that William Miller put together. And suddenly they're going to be at the old past. Oh, welcome. And, uh, and they're, they're going to accomplish this by raising up the foundations of many generations. We're not teaching that now. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how this line on the line works and how it impacts some of the truths that we deal with. Um, so, I'm now, if you have the syllabus, I'm on page 17 starting um, this particular study. Um, 
You know, I heard, I said it once, and I think I heard Jamal say it twice. If you're not familiar with these prophecy schools, I recommend to you the 2004 prophecy school to start with. It begins the basics. And one of the things that we nail down as a basic rule of prophecy in that school is that in Revelation chapter 1, the characteristic that Christ identifies of himself above all others is that he is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And we already read a quote in the first presentation that when the Lord repeats something, it's of great consequence. That's a paraphrase, but when it's repeated, it is important. And the thing that is repeated in Revelation chapter 1, more than any other thing about Christ, is that he is the God that portrays the end from the beginning. Okay, And Revelation chapter 1 is the... The, the point of reference is the key to understand the whole book of Revelation. So you'll hear Jamal and I almost automatically talk about that Christ is the God that illustrates the end from the beginning. And you can show this in a variety of ways. And one of them is, is that in time prophecies, the beginning history of a time prophecy parallels ending history. Jamal that was the history of the three decrees. And on the third decree, the 2300-year prophecy of Daniel 8.14 began. And it ended on the third message. Of course, Jamal dealt with the fourth decree of Nehemiah, which prefigures the fourth angel's message that takes place at the end of the world. But the point is this. In this time prophecy, the beginning history is identical to the end. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. What marks the beginning of the 1260 years of papal rule? What marks it is when the last king of the Goths fled the city of Rome. And from that point on, the papacy ruled the world supremely until 1798, when the big pope was taken out of the city of Rome. The prophecy begins when a king leaves the city of Rome. It ends when a king leaves the city of Rome. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. The 391 year, 15 day time prophecy of Revelation 9. Verse 14 and 15 begins when the last emperor of Eastern Rome surrenders his national sovereignty to the four great sultans of, of Turkey on July 27, 1449, and it ends when the last sultan of Turkey surrenders his national sovereignty to the four great European powers. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. And when you look at time prophecies, you see that over and over again. What's that down the bottom there? Like 391 years and 15 days. This is foundational to Adventism. This is one of the most attacked time prophecies in Adventism. It's on the chart. Yes. Um, Revelation chapter 9. Right. Verses 14 and 15. He said that. That's right. So. What I want you to see is that in the 2300 year prophecy, when, when Jamal was laying out the three decrees, this history that he laid out, this reform movement, it's identical to the reform movement of the Millerites. But you have a, another reform movement in the middle, which is the reform movement of Christ, or the time of Christ. And so we're going to look at that now. What we're saying is, is that each of these reform movements has a time of the end, and it's preceded by a time period of darkness, all right? The time of the end, we're, we're defining the time of the end based upon Daniel 12. The time of the end is the fulfillment of a prophecy. Adventists understand the time of the end of Daniel 12 is 1798 for, for the Millerites. The papacy receives its deadly wound. That's the fulfillment of a prophecy. It sheds light upon the upcoming history because in Daniel chapter 7, we are told that first the papacy receives a deadly wound and then judgment comes. That's a standard, correct Adventist understanding. 
when the papacy received its deadly wound after the dark ages, then there's light shed upon, upon the judgment. But in the history of Christ, which is this history here, which is a reform movement, the time of the end is the birth of Christ. And you can see this in Isaiah 7, 14. It's in your notes, page 17. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This history, when Christ is born, there's going to be an increase of knowledge. And according to Daniel 12, many shall run to and fro. And the man, that word running to and fro in Daniel 12 represents running to and fro in God's word. Okay, that's the, the Hebrew idiom that primarily is talking about running to and fro in the Bible. The time in the end for Christ, you should expect to see students of prophecy understanding that the birth of Christ is a fulfillment of prophecy and that it's shedding light upon the upcoming history. And what is the upcoming history? According to Isaiah 7, 14, it's Emmanuel, God with us. This is when Christ is going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. So at the birth of Christ, you have a fulfillment of prophecy, which is the time of the end. And the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy teaches that prior to this time period, there is darkness. All right? Where are the students of prophecy that are re recognizing this fulfillment of prophecy in the history of Christ? Pardon me? No. They were in the pagan countries. The wise men, the shepherds on the hill, Simeon, Anna in the temple. So we're seeing, we see the students of prophecy mark. With, with the three degrees, the student of prophecy was marked by Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, he understood by the book the number of years. Okay? It's the same thing. There's a fulfillment of prophecy. Then the Bible marks the students of prophecy, understanding the fulfillment of this prophecy as knowledge increases. And you can, you can mark the increase of knowledge when Christ is 12 years old and he's in the temple. That's an illustration of the increase of knowledge because all the, the Pharisees and Sadducees that were watching this 12-year-old boy realized that was some kind of knowledge that they were hearing. The increase of knowledge, the Bible says that Christ increased in knowledge and stature and wisdom. So the next thing that happens is that there, the message is going to be formalized. And the one that formalized the message in the Millerite history was who? William Miller. William Miller. And we've already read quotes. Who does Sister White most often compare William Miller with? John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is the one that formalizes the message in this history, maybe I better go about You can see darkness. You see a quote there. I'm not going to read it. You have many notes. How many do not have the syllabus? I have one, but I can't find it. All right. Um, how many of you don't have a syllabus and you don't have the money to buy a syllabus? Maybe you don't want to say that. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm there in the syllabus, and in this particular study, I'm not going to read every quote like Jamal is, and if you don't want to buy a syllabus and you have a laptop, I have these on the end of the stick. And Brother Merritt in the back wall is raising his hand saying that he will supply you with a syllabus if you don't have to have the money. So you'll see a quote that there was darkness before the Millerites, there was darkness before Christ. I, I'm, I'm now realizing that I'm doing both of these histories simultaneously, which is okay. And then you're seeing a quote on page 17 from Early Writings 233, where Sister White is comparing William Miller with John the Baptist. Um, and Jamal pointed out that the first message, the first way mark when it arrives, and then this one we're, right now we're dealing with the history of Christ, is that it would be worldwide in comparison to the second way mark which will be local. There's a geographical aspect with this. Um, and it matters. Making the distinction between worldwide and local matters when you come to the history of 144,000. <coughs> okay. We're, we're saying that when, when you bring this down to the end, that the worldwide aspect was that on September 11, 2001, everyone in the world knew what happened on September 11, 2001. And the next thing that happened was the Sunday law in the United States, which is local. Worldwide and local. So these these characteristics that we're pointing out, we're pointing them out 
so that we can line up the end of the world and they seem important to mark out, even if they're if they seem kind of mundane at this point. So if you at the bottom of page 17 from Matthew 3, verse 5. It says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan. This is talking about John the Baptist. And in the geographical setting of John the Baptist, the history of Christ, all of Judah, Jerusalem, the regions round about, came out to hear John the Baptist. In that geographical setting, it was worldwide. Whereas the second waymark has to do with the activities of the enemies. And the second way mark where the activities of the enemies are identified in the time of Christ is when the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem shows that it was expedient for Christ to die rather than the whole nation perish. It was local. But John the Baptist's message was worldwide. Um, the Millerite message on the top of the next page from Great Controversy 6.11 it says, the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. So let me, I forgot that I developed these notes this way. This is the Millerites. This is the history of Christ. What was the dark just before the Millerites kind of began. The Dark Ages. This is 1,206 years of Behu. The time of the end for the Millerites was 1798. When the Book of Daniel was unsealed, there was an increase of knowledge. The message was formalized by William Miller. And we take a quote from um, Sister White, where she points out that William Miller received his credentials in 1833, which was the same year as the falling of the stars. Yes, he began to preach in 1831. If you want to put 31, that's fine. But William Miller is the one that formalized the message of that time period. John the Baptist was the one that formalized the message of that time period. And then the message of both John the Baptist and William Miller would be worldwide. And um, in the first message, the foundation would be laid, all right? The, in the history of the first decree, the foundation of the temple was laid. We all pointed that out. The foundational message for the time of Christ, the foundational message, there's a message that John the Baptist brought. And on page 18, quoting from Matthew 3, verse 5 through 12, we see the foundational message for the history of Christ. It says, Then went out to him, out to John the Baptist, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized. That was part of the message at that time, the baptism. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. That confession of sins was part of that message. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There was a message of a wrath to come in that history, and John the Baptist pointed it out. It was a foundational. What was the wrath to come in that history? In 87, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, right? Who was warning to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Repentance was part of the foundational message of that time period. And think not to say within yourselves, we have to Abraham our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And that was part of the message, is that in that history, the Lord was going to raise up a different uh, line of Abraham. He was going to set aside the literal descendants of Abraham and um, organize the spiritual descendants of Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every truth which bringeth not forth good fruits is hewn down and cast into the fire. There is a separation process that is identified in these histories. Jamal always pointed it out, and that's what was foundational to John the Baptist's message. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost which was foundational, what was going to take place on Pentecost in this history. 
and with fire, his fan is in his fire, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John the Baptist laid the foundational message in this history, just as the foundation of the temple was laid in the history of the first decree. Now what we're saying is that Isaiah 58 and 12 says that one of the works of the 144,000 is they're going to raise up the foundations of many generations. Jamal's laid up the foundations of the generation of the three decrees. We've just pointed out the foundations of the generation of Christ. And in the next quote, we're going to identify that it's William Miller that was used by the Lord to lay the foundations of Adventism. In uh, Southern Watchman, January 24, 1905, um, I'll read the book now. Yes. Students of prophecy came to the conclusion that the time of the end was at hand. In the book of Daniel, they read of the 2,300 days eventually the sanctuary was cleansed. Thinking that the earth was the sanctuary, they understood that the cleansing foretold in Daniel 8.14 represented the purification of the earth by fire at the second coming of Christ. Searching the scriptures for further light and comparing this prophecy prophetic period with the records of historians, they learned that the 2,300 days extended to the year 1844. This was the foundation of the Great Advent Movement of 1844. The falling of the stars in 1833 gave added force to the proclamation of the message of the soon coming Savior through the labors of William Miller and many others in America, of 700 ministers in England, of Van Gogh and others in Germany, of Goss and his followers in France and Switzerland, many ministers in Scandinavia, of the converted Jesuit in South America, and Joseph Wolf in many Oriental and African countries, the Advent message was carried to a large part of the habitable globe. The next quote we will deal with a little bit further on, but we'll put it in here. Review and Herald, April 14, 1903. The warning has come. Nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we've been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. The foundational message that is associated with the work of William Miller is the message that's represented on this chart. When she says, the foundation of the faith is a message that came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. In that history, there was 300 Millerite preachers, and every one of them used this chart exclusively. This was the only thing that they were teaching. So when she's talking about the message of 1842, 1843, and 1844, and calling it the foundation, this is the foundation of Adventism, and William Miller is the one that's associated with them, putting this together. And he's the one that's associated with this first message. Foundations of Adventism were laid in this first time period. And you'll find that when it comes to the reform movement of the 144,000, that one of the first things that they have to do is they have to return to the foundations of many generations. When you're studying these things, you know that you're in this history here. You're laying foundation. Yeah, you're, you're laying the foundation. So the next way, Mark, would be the activities of the enemies. Um, and the local in the time of Christ, we have on the bottom of page 18. Now, Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. The second way, Mark, we see the activities of the enemies. Um, Jamal's putting it like this. I like that. They're, they're trying to stop the work, they're trying to stop the movement of that time period. The false, the, the decree to stop the work um, here by false murders is parallel um, to the Sanhedrin choosing that Christ should die rather than the whole nation perish. And it's paralleling um, in the top of page 19 what the Protestant churches did um, in the center of page 19. A public action from the enemies in the time of the Millerites. It says, in June 1842, Mr. Miller gave the second course of lectures at the Casco Street Church in Portland, Maine. With few exceptions, the different denominations closed the doors of their churches against Mr. Miller. This is June of 1842. The second message arrives with the activities of the enemies. The Protestants close their doors against the Millerites. The Sanhedrin closes their doors against Christ. The, the, Jew, the enemies of the Jews have the work stopped by the false decree. 
Um, local action, and when the Sanhedrin did that, that took place in, in Jerusalem, whereas John the Baptist's message was for Jerusalem, Judea, and all the regions round about. And here, at the top of page 19, it says, the second angel, from the Great Controversy 389, the second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844, and then it had a more direct application to the churches of the United States, where the warning of the Jesuits had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected, and where the declension of, in the churches had been most rapid. In this sense, the second angel's message was local. Great Controversy 611 said the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world, but the second angel's message was fulfilled in the USA. Okay. You see the, the logic? Yes, no? Yeah. Yes. Um, now, in this up here, this here that Jamal did last time, the history of Nehemiah. There is no illustration of the manifestation of the power of God in between the, the second and third decree. But we find those. But you only need to see them two or three times and they're established. And you find them in the history of Christ. And this is what we're using to identify a manifestation of the power of God. In between, uh, uh, sorry, wrong place. In between the second and the third decree, you will see a manifestation of the power of God. And we'll show you what those are in a second. And, uh, still on page 19, manifestation of the power of God in Christ in the right time period. It's the manifestation of the power of God in, in the history of Christ that Sister White uses to illustrate the midnight cry, the manifestation of the right history. She says, the midnight cry from Spirit Prophecy, Volume 4, page 250. The midnight cry was not so much carried by argument, though the scripture proof was clear and conclusive. There went with it an impelling power that moved the soul. There was no doubt, no questioning. Upon the occasion of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the people who were assembled from all parts of the land to keep the feast flocked to the Mount of Olives. And as they joined the throng that were escorting Jesus, they caught the inspiration of the hour and helped swell the cry, the shout, Thus it is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In like manner did unbelievers who flocked to the Adventist meeting, some from curiosity, some merely to ridicule, feel the convincing power attending the message, Behold the bridegroom cometh. The triumphal entry of Christ takes place after the Sanhedrin chooses that he should die. And if you remember the story, the, the Jews said, make the children quit crying out. And Christ says, if the Jews don't cry out, the very rocks will cry out. It's impossible for God to lie. If no one had been crying out there, the very rocks would have cried out. This was a manifestation of the power of God. And this history is what such a right uses to illustrate the history of the midnight cry that was in the time period of the second angel's message just prior to October 22nd, 1844. In fact, the midnight cry in the Millerite history arrived at a camp meeting, Exeter, Maine, New Hampshire. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. I thought you were still Maine. Sorry, um, From August 12th to 17th, there was a camp meeting, and Samuel Snow presented the understanding that allowed them to identify October 22nd, 1844, and they left that camp meeting on the 17th of August, and in the next two months, they carried that message across the United States um, in a time period when there wasn't any internet or any telephones or any airplanes or any cars or any paved roads. It was a manifestation of the power of God. They took the message across the United States from New Hampshire in roughly two months. In the center of page 19, you'll see a quote from Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21. And it said that in June 1842, with few exceptions, the Protestant churches closed their doors against the message of William Miller. And the point being is that it's at this point 
that the, you see the activities of the enemies, it's at this point that the second way mark arrives. Now, I re also read a quote here for, at the top of the page, where she says the second angel's message was first preached in the summer of 1844. This is worth noting. I'm saying the second angel's message arrives in 1842, but it isn't preached until the summer of 1844. And this is a characteristic of all these messages. It'll arrive in history, but God's people don't understand the significance of it for some time after. I mean, on October 22nd, 1844, the third angel's message is a, had arrived in history, and the third angel's message is a, uh, a discussion of Sabbath and Sunday. And the Millerites didn't understand Sabbath and Sunday on October 23rd, 1844. When the message arrives is not necessarily when it's, it doesn't get preached initially. Um, you can you can also argue that the first angel's message in in actuality arrived in 1798. It wasn't preached until it's formalized and preached. Um, so we're marking June of 1842 when the Protestant churches closed their doors against the Millerites as the arrival of the second angel's message. Second angel's message is the call out of Babylon. Um, which the second and fourth angels message will, will have a call out of that one. Um, on the next page, this is an important quote here. In, in, the, in the material that we share, this is a very important quote. Um, Jamal read a little bit about the fact that in the history of the second decree, leading up to the third decree, that it was a life or death situation. And when, in the history of the second decree, is when Zechariah expressed the words, come out of Babylon, okay? You may not, I might lose you here, but in the history of the first decree, and the history of the third decree, there is no reference in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy of any prophet or any person saying, come out of Babylon. But in the history of the second decree, Zechariah says, come out of Babylon. Okay, the reason for that is the way mark of the second decree is the second angel's message, and the second angel's message is come out of Babylon. So that's why that expression is in that second decree. But, when you carry it further, Sister White commenting on that, and I think it's in your notes, the reason that Zechariah was so convicted to call people to come out of Babylon was because he foresaw, God foresaw, the troublous times of Esther, Esther's husband, in the story of Esther, what's what's her, her husband's name? Xerxes. Xerxes. But Xerxes is the one that proclaims the third decree, or Xerxes, okay? It's the same God. So Zechariah, the Lord convicts Zechariah to call people out of Babylon because he understands this life-death struggle that's going to take place in the story of Esther. And of course, this life-death struggle is is prefiguring not only October 22nd, 1844, but it's prefiguring the Sunday law, it's prefiguring a lot of things. So this call out of Babylon has the life-death issue to it. And, and here on early writings, page 259, and we're not reading all of this to you, but we're, we're going to read all of this to you, but I'm leaving some of it. This is two paragraphs. I'm leaving the paragraph that precedes this out until further on. Because there's more to say about this than what we're going to say here. This history of Christ is life or death, all right? It's a progressive testing process. And so was the history of the Millerites, brothers and sisters. This is one of the most important things to understand. From the time to the end, based upon Daniel 12, you have an increase of knowledge. The increase of knowledge is going to produce two classes of worshipers. This must be understood by Adventism. Because there's an increase of knowledge that comes to the 144,000. And based on how we, God's people living at the end of the world, respond to the increase of knowledge will determine whether we're a wise or foolish virgin, whether in the terminology of Daniel 12, whether we're wise or wicked. The wicked don't understand the increase of knowledge, but the wise understand it. Because this is a life or death issue. Um, so in... Early writings, page 259, speaking of the history of Christ, she says this. 
I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. John the Baptist was sent in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of Jesus. Those who rejected the testimony of John were not benefited by the teachings of Jesus. So if you, if John, the messenger of the first way mark in this history, if you reject what he has to say, the teachings of Jesus aren't going to do you any good at all. You have to accept what John says to be benefited by Jesus. It's a progressive testing process. Those who rejected the testimony of John were not benefited by the teachings of Jesus. Their opposition to the message that foretold his coming placed them where they could not readily receive the strongest evidence that he was the Messiah. Satan led on those who rejected the message of John to go still farther to reject and crucify Christ. In doing this, they placed themselves where they could not receive the blessing on the day of Pentecost, which would have taught them the way into the heavenly sanctuary. Dropping down to a few sentences, when she's concluding this, there's a short sentence, it's the fifth line from the bottom of that paragraph, she says, but the Jews were left in total darkness. Okay? So in the history of Christ, you have a, the time of the end, a fulfillment of a prophecy, an increase of knowledge, John the Baptist formalizes the message, he puts it into, into a package that could test this generation. And those people that accepted John the Baptist's test, they could be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. But they're still going to be tested further. They're still going to have to take the teachings of Jesus and incorporate them into their life in order to find their way into the holy place with Christ, which is Pentecost. And it's a progressive testing process that parallels the concept of Daniel 12 of an increase of knowledge. Okay? Then she goes in, and then this is the next paragraph. I have them separated to make a point, but in the very next paragraph, after she finishes this statement about the history of Christ, she says, Many look with horror at the course of the Jews in rejecting and crucifying Christ, and as they read the history of his shameful abuse, they think they love him, and would not have denied him as did Peter, or crucified him as did the Jews. But God, who reads the hearts of all, has brought to the test that love for Jesus, which they profess to fill. All heaven watched with the deepest interest the reception of the first angel's message. Okay, that's William Miller. Yes. But many who professed to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the story of the cross derided the good news of his coming. Instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. They hated those who loved his appearing and shut them out of the churches in June 1842. With few exceptions, they began to close the door of their churches. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second, neither were they benefited by the midnight cry. Notice the progressive testing process. Now they're not benefited by the midnight cry, and for, which would was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message, which shows the way into the most holy place. I saw that as the Jews crucified Jesus, so the non the churches have crucified these messages, and therefore they have no knowledge of the way into the most holy, and they cannot be benefited by the intercession of Jesus there. Like the Jews who offered their useless sacrifices, they offer up their useless prayers to the apartment which Jesus has left, and Satan, pleased with the deception, assumes a religious character and leads the mind of these professed, professed Christians to himself, working with his power, his signs, and lying wonders to fasten them with his prayer. William Miller, this increase of knowledge that tested the generation of the Millerites. William Miller brought the first angel's message. The first angel's message is the everlasting gospel, correct? Amen. And the everlasting gospel is set forth in Genesis 3.15. Amen. Yes. And it doesn't, it doesn't change anywhere in the Bible. It's always the everlasting gospel. And the everlasting gospel in Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and thy woman. Who's he speaking to here? Satan. 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 He's going to put hatred between Satan and the woman. And the woman in Bible prophecy is who? Church. 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 And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, between Satan's seed, and her seed, the seed of the church, and Christ's seed. And it shall bruise, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Christ is ultimately going to kill Satan. Stop on his head, but at the cross he's going to bruise his heel. But the point is, the everlasting gospel is 
It's the work of putting enmity between two classes of worshipers, between Satan's seed and Christ's seed. And the Millerites, in this history, uh, when this increase of knowledge is taking place, they proclaim the first angel's message, which is the everlasting gospel. They proclaimed it, but they experienced it. Because when they get to October 22nd, 1844, 50 of them move into the most holy place with Christ. That's Christ's seed. And 49,950 stay in the holy place with Satan. That's Satan's seed. And he has put enmity between those two classes of worshipers. Amen. Not only have they proclaimed the everlasting gospel, they had experienced it. And this is illustrated in every reform movement. And it takes place in the reform movement of the 144,000. And it's accomplished by how we relate to the increase of prophetic knowledge that comes to God's people at the end of time. Amen. So, running out of time. Notice that, that Jamal pointed out correctly, Bible and Spirit prophecy and historians mark that the temple was finished before the third degree. The temple is finished before the third degree. And the temple here is, is finished, destroyed this body, and in three days I will raise it up. And the, the third way mark for Christ is the cross. This is where the temple is finished in this history. But in John 2, right after Christ cleansed the temple, the Jews asked Christ for a sign, and this is where he says, in John 9, 2, 19, 20, he says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? Christ rears up the temple here at the third way mark at the cross. And the spiritual temple that was raised up in the Millerite history was raised up in 46 years, from 1798 to 1844. And you can demonstrate this from the 2520 time prophecies, and we haven't done that yet. Pardon me? 46 years. 1798. To 1844. And if we're not quite there yet, we're running out of time, but there's a passage in Great Controversy where Sister White says that the coming of the, to the bridegroom of Matthew 25, the coming to, of the ancient of days in Daniel 7 13, uh, and Daniel 8 14, and Malachi chapter 3 are the same event. Okay, and the, the, that quote is in your note. I'm not going to refer to it, I'm just going to point you to it. But she's saying they're the same event. Daniel 7.13 was fulfilled on October 22nd, 1844. Daniel 8.14 was fulfilled, but also was Malachi 3. And in Malachi 3, it talks about the messenger of the covenant coming suddenly to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant confirms the covenant with modern Israel on October 22nd, 1844. So he does that work. But in order for him to come to his temple, he has to raise up the temple. And according to John 2.20, it takes 46 years to raise up this temple. And it was raised up prior. It was finished, just as the temple over there was finished before the third decree. The 1850 chart will demonstrate 46 years. It has the proper date on that chart. Okay. Um, they can get the chart we have underneath this. We're not quite there yet. And I'm running out of time to get through all of this. Um, the third degree is where you see judgment. You, of course, if what we're, I hope you're getting what we're saying about this. Here's what we're saying about this. I'm going to say it enough times so even if you don't believe it, you know that I'm making this contention. I'm saying that in, Dan, in Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 14, where it talks about this being refreshing, yet they would not hear, that the way that the latter rain message is taught is by bringing line upon line. And the lines upon lines that teach the latter end message are these lines. These reform movements, as they're brought together, they're going to identify the way marks that take place during the time period of the 144,000. Okay, so I'm making an a, a, a absolutely outlandish claim. If this is false, this is deep, dark error. You need, to, you need to hear what I'm saying so you can evaluate whether it's true or not. And one of the things that I haven't mentioned, but Jamal mentioned, is this first way, Mark, William Miller, um, John the Baptist, these reformers that are associated with the first message, um, 
John the Baptist, William Miller, Moses, Noah, Elijah, they were all reform movements. They're all symbols of the reformers that bring this first message. It convicts of sin. Right? And then in the second way, Mark, you see righteousness manifested. There was righteousness manifested in this history of the midnight cry, in this history of the triumphal entry. Righteousness is manifested. And then judgment is illustrated. It, it was here that the Jews' national sovereignty and the third decree was returned in Daniel or in Ezra 7, verses 25 and 26. They could punish their civil and their religious criminals up to death. Their national sovereignty had been restored. They could judge. You see judgment in this. The judgment in the history of Christ is the judgment of the cross. The judgment in the history of the Millerites, judgment begins. What I'm saying, though, what I'm trying to emphasize, is this: these reform movements are structured upon the work of the Holy Spirit, which is three steps. And Jamal read it, to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So you, gotta, you need to factor that in. This is built upon being... The work of the Holy Spirit. What I think Jamal was saying was it's when we resist understanding the work of the Holy Spirit that we find ourselves in the position of committing the unpardonable sin. Um, we need to test this thing. You'll see the judgment illustrated on page 21. You'll see a quote that talks about judgment at the cross. Um, the judgment of the Millerites is illustrated. And then, of course, we know that immediately after the cross, the disciples were disappointed, and we know that the sister wife uses the disappointment of the disciples to illustrate the disappointment of the Millerites immediately after October 22nd, 1844, just as Jamal pointed out that Ezra was disappointed after the third decree about how few people came out of Babylon. So there's always a disappointment after the third way mark, and the characteristic of the third way mark is judgment. Are you with me? Okay. And then there's always a work given. Okay, the work. The work that was given to Adventism was to uh, proclaim the third angel's message. You can go see that on the top of page 22. But the work that was given to the disciples was to carry the message of the cross to the world, correct? Right. But after the work, what comes? Backs to the So we know from Bible prophecy, we don't have to know anything about what the General Conference brethren are doing or what's going on in the church in Adventism. We know from this, this history right here that Adventism was given the work to do immediately after 1844, but before the fourth angel's message arrived, that Adventism would go into a backslidden condition. And of course, we understand that to be the Laodicean message. We are the Laodicean. So we know that from prophecy. We can say that without being critical. But how is it that before Pentecost, which is the fourth way mark in the history of Christ, which prefigures the latter reign in our time period, how is it that we see a backslidden condition illustrated in the history of the disciples? They went fishing. See that um, on page 22 from John 21, 4 through 6. It's a minor inference to their backslidden condition, but it's there like all the other reform movements. But Jesus had to come to them. That's the symbol of worldly pursuit. Symbol of worldly pursuit, worldliness, okay. Jesus had to come to them and remind them that they were to be fishers of men, not fishers of fish. But our backslidden condition is much more obvious and much um, easier to demonstrate. Um, therefore, before Pentecost, there would have to be a number one message, and the number one message that came before Pentecost, I'm just going to tell it to you uh, so we can get this done on time and we have reason to know. Uh, the number one the message, the number one message is a message of reform. And before Pentecost, what did the disciples have to do? They had to put their differences away, right? Before Pentecost had come. That's representing a work of reform. Remember that this history here that's illustrating these things from the cross to Pentecost was how many days? 50 days. 50 days. So, so these inferences about accident condition and a work of reform, they are, they're subtle, but they are there. Then the Spirit is poured out, and then for a long time I have taught that um, 
I believe the judgment was on Ananias and Sapphira for them resisting the spirit. I, I don't think that any longer. I'll go and reckon that he did resist on the next evening. The reason for that Amen. is it's here is where Michael is standing up. It lines up down here. In any case, there's a judgment carried out upon the church here. And therefore, at the end of the world, Adventism will be confronted with a reform message. We understand that to be the Laodicean message. We have to accept the Laodicean message. Um, Sister White, in Select Message of Book 1, page 121, says, Our greatest need and, and our first work is to seek for a revival. In Testimonies to Ministers, page 113, she says, When we understand the books of Daniel and Revelation, that we should really see among us a great revival. If, on page 128 of Book 121, Book one, second message of book one, page 121, says our greatest need and our first work is to seek for a revival. And then seven pages later on page 128, she says revival represents a renewal of spiritual life. If our greatest need is for a revival, it means we're spiritually dead. Okay. And Testimonies and Ministers 113 tells us the way that we're brought back to life is through the prophetic word. So we have to have a reform message come here, and it comes from prophecy. When we're awakened, um, we will receive the latter rain. The number four, the, in the, the latter rain message that we understand is the fourth angel's message, which is a call out of Babylon, just as the second angel's message is a call out of Babylon. And then, of course, Michael is going to stand up and give him probation for the judgment. It's illustrated. Um, the seven, uh, it, 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 in, the, in the disappointments, many times, not always, many times you'll see number seven. For, for the time of Christ, Christ rested in this grave on this, the seventh day. And for the Millerites, they had to understand the Sabbath here. There wasn't one that I know of. There isn't one after the third decree. But there's definitely one in Noah and Elijah. And uh, we'll get to those as we proceed. Um, I want to add a couple more things on page 24. Just to, for a point of reference, because we'll read this later. The, this reform movement of Christ is perhaps the most complete of all of them. Some of them are more complete. If you like to go over here. After Pentecost, we have AD 70. And AD 70 is the destruction of Jerusalem, which Sister White identifies as representing the time period of the seven last plagues. Right. And then in AD 100, in the, in the history of Christ, we have the second coming of Christ illustrated. On the top of page 24, the second paragraph, Sister White says this, from Manuscript Releases, Volume 19, page 40. In the days of, early, of the early Christians, Christ came the second time. His first advent was at Bethlehem when he came as an infant. His second advent was at the Isle of Patmos, when he revealed himself in glory to John the Revelator, who fell at his feet as dead when he saw him. So, all I'm saying is all, all, we're, we're taking the characteristics of these reform movements and building them, but when you look at the story of Christ, his reform movement goes all the way to the end of the world. Okay. And which lines up with us. Here Michael stands up and human probation closes. You have the seven last plagues and the second coming of Christ. Um, page 
was in power for the Millerites when the angel of Revelation 10 came down on August 11th, 1840. In fulfillment of the time prophecy in Revelation 9, verses 14 and 15. Um, and there's much to say about that. John the Baptist's message was empowered at the baptism of Christ when the dove came down. And Sister White, or the Bible even points out, uh, there was a point, you don't know this story, when the Pharisees were questioning Christ, and he, his answer to them was, was the baptism of John a man or of God? And the Pharisees couldn't answer. Because if they answered it was of God, then they were going to be in trouble for persecuting him. And if they said he was of a man, the people were going to turn against him because the people believed that John was a prophet. <coughs> and it's from that fact that you realize that John the Baptist's message was empowered at the baptism. Okay, that was the empowerment. Now, more importantly, and we'll deal with this later, when the, when the symbol comes down, not only is the message empowered, but there's a testing process that begins. Jesus immediately went out in the desert to be tested. Um, right here is where John, in Revelation 10, takes the little book and eats it and it's sweet in his mouth. Sweet in his mouth because the year day principle had been confirmed before the whole world. This is the testing process here and here that we read about in early writings, page 259. When the divine symbol comes down, a testing process begins among God's people. Therefore, if you could mark when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down and joins the third angel's message, if you can mark that in history, then you know that you're in the final testing process of that angel. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for bringing us here safely to start this prophecy school. And we know that we're, we're putting out a lot of information here um, very rapidly to start with. And some of us aren't familiar with these things. We ask that you bless us with the understanding that we need to, to put these things in proper perspective. Help us remember them, that we can test them, that we can really compare what we're being told with your word, with the spirit of prophecy in the Bible. We wish to understand what you have for us in these things. We ask you to give us a, a full measure of your spirit before you die laying out upon us. And we know that we have a solid four days of study ahead of us, so we ask that you give us rest in that. Bless us with that, that we can be refreshed to take up this study tomorrow. And uh, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.